Welcome back to your favorite podcast, Deke to Deke. In this episode, I had a chance to sit down with Hall of Famer and former women's head golf coach, Diane Daly. Now, Coach Daly has left a legacy as a trailblazer, as a great player, and also a groundbreaking coach. And in this episode, she shares her story about her coaching journey and also, of course, her favorite Deacon moment. So stay tuned. Don't forget to subscribe and always go Deeks. So, uh, Coach Daly, let's start from, from the beginning. So where are you originally from? I'm originally from Frankfort, Kentucky, which is a small town. It's the capital town in, uh, in Kentucky. What was it like growing up in Frankfort, Kentucky? Well, it, there wasn't a lot of trouble you could get into. And <laughs> it was good. And, you know, it was, it was a town of maybe 25,000 people, and everybody knew everyone else, and you go into the local restaurants and, you know, all the servers knew who you were and, you know, they all just spoke to you and, you know, just typical small town um, at growing up and, and you really developed some nice friendships and all of that. So it was, it was fun. It was good. So how did you get into golf coming from a small town? Well, my dad used to go out and play on the weekends. And so I'd go out and pull his bag and that's why <laughs> I started doing that. And then they had uh, some junior golf clinics that, at the club there, we, I grew up on a nine hole golf course. And so um, I wanted to play tennis, but there wasn't a backboard and there wasn't anyone to play tennis with. So I figured I better find something I can do. If I had to play by myself, I could do all right. And so golf was it. And uh, so that's, I just started playing in these junior clinics and, um, and then the ladies there at the course were so kind to me. They changed all the rules so that I could play with them. And, you know, they were, everyone was so encouraging. And, you know, my parents were the same. They were they were always trying to um, help me out if they could and encourage me to play. Did having such support from your family and, and the community help you kind of fall in love with the game? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think if, if it had been difficult for me to have played, I probably would not have. But, you know, this is all pre-Title IX. I mean, this is growing yeah. up, girls don't play sports. And, um, but the, you know, I, I just had so many people all along the way who were just so encouraging and so supportive. That really made a difference for me. Now, when you got to high school, you continued to play. You had a lot of success. Some people even described you as a prodigy uh, winning state championships. What attributed, attributed to that success and development that you had as a player? Well, when I was in high school, I wanted to play um, golf, and there were no sports for girls. And um, so I went over and asked the boys coach if I could play on his team. And he said, no, you can't. And he said, if you want to have, if you want to play golf on the team, you start your own. So I said, okay. And so that's what I did. And, and we had, I had two friends that were pretty good players. And then we had another friend who was sort of a natural athlete. And so we, the three of us taught her how to play golf. And then two years later, we won the, nat we won the, the state championship. So that was kind of fun. How did that feel to to be told no and then to go out and to be challenged and to not just create a team, but a very successful, I mean, a championship team? What 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 did that feel like? Well, at first it felt, you know, like a slap in the face, but mm -hmm. then it felt like, you know, if, if, if he wants me to start my own team, I'll do it. You know, I'm one of these people that if somebody tells me no, I'll, unless it's a re good reason for it, no, I'm going to try to figure out a way to say yes and, and try to figure out a way to make it work. And, uh, and that's what we did. We were determined. And when we went to the state tournament, the boys team was supposed to win and we weren't. And, and it ended up that we both, we won. And so that was kind of fun. And they didn't. So that was, you know, it was, and we were the first girls to ever letter in a sport at our high school. Wow. That's so that was awesome. kind of fun. We sort of set the, the pace there and, and, you know, now they have a full complement of sports, but it was really fun to uh, be the first there. So what drew you to Salem College from Kentucky? What was it about Salem College? Well, I've always loved history. And, you know, Frankfurt is a very historic town being the capital. And um, I grew up just knowing all about Kentucky history. And um, when I saw old Salem and Salem College, I said, oh, this is the spot for me. I, I, I could just be going to school and living history at the same time. And, you know, it was a small school and I, I probably needed a smaller school coming from a small town instead of a big university. And, um, 
you know, and, and, and as it turned out, it was absolutely the right decision because um, I was able to grow and develop as a student there and as a person. And, you know, you had chances to, to uh, take on leadership roles and that kind of thing. And that was really helpful. And I got a great education. And then they had this wonderful field down behind the tennis courts where I could practice golf every day. So it worked out perfectly. Now, they, from if I'm not mistaken, during that time, the NCAA did not have uh, women's golf tournaments at that time. How were you able to continue to keep playing while uh, still in school at the same time? How did you balance that? Because you continued to play. Oh, yes, I did. And I played, I mean, I practiced every day. And um, I never had, I didn't have a car until my junior year. And, um, and I just loved practicing. And we had two tournaments that we could play in. One was at Mary Baldwin and one was um, at UNCG. And that was it. Um, but at the time, it was a national collegiate championship run by the AIAW, which is the Association of Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, and which was basically um, an organization of physical education teachers. And they were doing their, they were volunteering their time to run a national championship. And there was one in golf. Actually, the first national championship ever for women was in golf in 1946. And uh, and that was at the request of Patty Berg, because she said there weren't enough tournaments for, for girls to play in. And so she asked the athletic, uh, uh, or the physical education teacher at Ohio State to sponsor a tournament, which she did. And it ran all the way through to 1982, when um, the, uh, uh, all the women's sports became a part of the NCAA. But at the time I was playing, it was a strictly an individual tournament match play. And so you would go and qualify and then then you would at the low 64 would start playing matches the next day. So it was a little bit different. But then when I got to be a junior, they added team competition. And so if you had two people from the same school, you could have a team. And um, it didn't make any difference. There were no divisions. You, we had junior colleges. We had, if, all you had to do is be enrolled in a higher education institution and you could play. That was, and, and the other criteria was that you could not accept any athletic scholarships from anybody. So that was, wow. it was really, really different back then. Yeah. How did you, how, how would, how did you play during that time uh, with, you had the schools coming from the different areas. Did that make it more competitive because there weren't any divisions? So, you know, people were just showing up. That's right. And there were no coaches. I mean, you just, you just wouldn't play. It was just like a tournament. And um, so, you know, it was fun. I met some really nice people doing that and, became friends for all of our careers in, in golf. And, uh, um, but no, it was, it was, it was fine. It was, it was good. And I mean, that was just the way it was. And um, so I would practice. And then if, if, I mean, I wanted to make sure that when I practiced that I was, you know, working on my game. So that if somebody were to ask me to come out and play with them sometime, then I would be ready to go play and, and be, you know, not, not so rusty. So it was good. Now, what, a lot of people may not know about you, and, and I found out from doing some research is after uh, graduating from Salem College, you spent a year in Switzerland on a farm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was. What was that experience like? Well, it was a real interesting experience. Um, you know, I was always a pretty shy person, and and so, but I, I wanted to. You know, I had such a good experience at Salem, and I liked history. And I really got into art history. And so, you know, I thought, well, this was back when, you know, that was the hippies and all that. Not that I was a hippie, but it was just like everybody was a free spirit kind of thing. And, well, I wanted to go to a different country and not know anybody and um, have to speak a different language, learn a different culture and, um, and see if I could make it. And um, that's what I did. And so I, I went to this farm in Switzerland and they spoke French and German. And I went for six months without speaking any English and uh, worked on this farm. And I'd never been on a farm before either. And so it was a real eye-opening experience. But afterwards, I felt like anything could, you know, I could probably handle just about anything, you know. And the good thing was after, the, after I was on the farm for nine months, I got to travel all around Europe for three months and see all the things I'd studied in college. And so it was all worthwhile. It was really fun. 
Coach, that's amazing. You picked up two languages in a year, didn't speak English for six months. I struggled in four years to get Spanish at Wake Forest. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're around it all the time, it, it kind of sinks in. <laughs> that, that, is, that is pretty amazing. And so you come back, you get your master's at Wake, and then you start playing on the LPGA tour. What was right. that? What was the tour like during that time? Well, I got my master's at state in, in at NC State. That's right. Yeah. And but um, when I played on the tour, it was before um, we had so many players. I mean, if we had uh, 80 players playing in a tournament, it was a, you know, a big deal. Right now, you know, we have 144 people on the wait list. So and it was like a it was like a big family. Everybody knew each other. Everybody was supportive of each other. Um, you know, we traveled around together almost in caravans. Um, and the way they had the, the schedule set, um, you would play out west and then you would have like five or six tournaments and you could drive to all of those and you fly back east and then you could drive to all the ones on the east coast. So it was it was fun. And, you know, the the friendships I made there were amazing. And, and you know, it was not as cutthroat as I would say, you know, athletics tend to be now. Um, I remember one time I was playing and I didn't play particularly well. And Donna Capone came up to me and she said, what are you doing after you get done here? And I said, um, I'm probably gonna go have lunch. And she said, well, come over here and let me help you with your chipping. And she gave me a chipping lesson, you know? And oh, wow. so, you know, that kind of stuff, I don't think would happen as much now, you know, that, that she just, just volunteered. And I said, I'll, 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 I'll take anything you want to give me. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how people were back then. They were just, they're always helping each other out. So not only did you play on the tour, but you uh, were in service of, to the tour as vice president and, and president. What was that like being in leadership of the, the tour at that time? And what are some of the things that some of your accomplishments that you were most proud of? Well, it was really an interesting experience to be in the administrative part of the tour to see you know, how hard the commissioner worked for, to get sponsors and what, how important it was for the, the players to, uh, you know, really step up and go to these parties, even though they didn't want to, and, and you know, make sure that their pro-am partners really had a good time playing. And, and it was, you know, we, we stressed that we were in the entertainment business as well as the sports business. Um, but a couple of the things that, you know, one of the things that I tried to do was I had uh, monthly meetings with all the players so that we could talk to them about all the things that we were working on you know, and, and try to get their input. Um, I started a, a speaker's bureau so that um, that if, if a sponsor wanted to have a player come and talk um, on media day or at a, at a charity event, that kind of thing, then we had a, we had a pool of players who could do that. Uh, we started junior golf clinics so that we had a junior golf clinic almost every tournament. And that was sort of our community service to bring these uh, kids out, boys and girls to come out and and we did a, a turn, I mean, a little clinic for them. And so that was fun. And then the other thing that, that I found when I was out there that um, a lot of the players didn't have anything else that they could do. Um, if they didn't play golf, they were, they were, they were all, I, I felt like a lot of them were staying out there way too long and kind of going through their money and that kind of thing. And so we started a, um, an internship program with our sponsors. And, and had and let the uh, players, if they wanted to, um, do an internship in the winter time and, and uh, wow. learn some job, job skills. And so we had one, one player who was really good, very musically minded. And she came up with all these songs for their tournament that, you know, for, I think it was the Rochester tournament. And they played it on TV and you know, it, was, it was just great. We had a great time. So that, those are some of the things that we tried to, you know, to give back some to the sponsors and to the community. And then, you know, let the players know how important it was that um, they be a part of all this because it's, it, that's, that's, we need their sponsor support. So with that leadership role with the tour, how did you get into coaching? What, what led you in that, that direction? Well, that's an interesting story because um, when I was out on tour, I would come back and I would talk with the, the golf team here at Wake, the women's golf team, Marge and Dot would have me over and we'd sit around and talk. And, um, and, and then um, Dot told me that she wanted to retire and she wanted me to apply for her job, which I, I thought that would be a lot of fun, you know, because I'd had some um, 
administrative experience at Salem being an assistant academic dean. And then I'd had some sports experience with uh, playing on the tour. And I thought I could combine those two things. And so the job that I applied for at Wake was the women's athletic director's job. But after I applied, they added a golf coach. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I was sort of surprised, but uh, it worked out, you know, that I, I said, I told him, I said, I really don't know how to coach, but I know golf, but I don't know a lot about coaching. And, and uh, they said, you'll figure it out. So, <laughs> so and I guess I did, but I tell you, the students really helped me out on that because, um, you know, I, 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 I told them I could help them with their golf and they had to help me teach them and, and tell me what was most effective about how to teach them and, and uh, how they wanted to be coached. And that was the first meeting we had and, and that really worked out well. And I ended up doing that almost every year I would ask the students because everybody's different and you have to treat them differently. So what was it about Wake though that you know attracted you to say, you know what, this is a, a, a place where I could work? Because I'm pretty sure you could have had other opportunities at other schools. And what was it about Wake Forest though? Oh, I love Wake Forest and I love the, um, what the, what the university stands for, the pro humanitate. I love the faculty interaction with the students and how those relationships build over four years. Uh, I love the learning process and the developmental process that the students go through in the four years that they're here. Um, you know, I just felt like golf was a, was a, a way to help them grow as, as a person, as a young lady, um, versus having them all be professional golfers. I mean, that's fine if they want to do that. But what a really special place. I, I just, I, I just, am, I, everything is, is just perfect, I think, here, because particularly for the faculty, the faculty really care about the students. And there have been times when um, we would get ready to go on a trip and a, a student would call me up on the team and say, you know, we have this test on when I get back and I don't even understand the material, much less knowing how to study for it. And I said, well, why don't you meet with your faculty member because we're driving the next day. And, and see if you can meet before we leave and we'll wait until you get done, but you meet with them. And uh, they did. And, and it ended up that faculty member tutored that person. And, you know, they ended up doing very well in the class. And I think that's just typical of the experience that, that the students have at Wake Forest. And I just am a firm believer in, in all of that. And I just, I felt like I was so fortunate to have get to know a lot of the faculty and interact with them. and and then see our students just really develop into confident and talented young women when they graduate. Well, coach, you took over the position with, with no coaching experiences. You and I were talking about a little bit before. So who were some of your mentors at like some of your coaching mentors that helped, helped you to, to grow and develop as a coach? Well, Dot Gunnels over at UNC uh, Chapel Hill was wonderful to me. She, um, you know, she kind of took me aside and she would say that, this is what you need to do in the tournaments. And, you know, and she would help me a lot. I mean, I, I just can't tell you how much she helped me. And then um, the coach at Texas was also another good one. And then Betty Lou Evans at Kentucky. Um, you know, there were, these were the ladies that started these golf programs back in the 70s. And, you know, they had been there for a long time. And I was actually the first um, person from the LPGA to be at a Division I, coaching at a Division I school. And, wow. and so... Um, that was, um, you know, really different for me and, and different for the students. And, and I think what happened was that, um, you know, these ladies that started these programs, they were wonderful. But as they began to phase out, um, the school started hiring more um, teachers, more you know, people with coaching experience. And I think the, because of that, um, and the, the quality of play got better really quickly. You know, when I first started coaching, we couldn't give advice on the golf course. And oh. I mean, we were the only, only uh, sport in the NCAA that could not give advice when in competition. And uh, wow. so that was, that to me didn't make any sense at all. And, and so once we were able to get that rule change um, uh, and we could give advice, then, you know, these students got a lot better. You know, that you could talk to them while they're playing, you could keep them calm. You could help them with shot selection, club selection, all those things that, you know, you want to do when you coach. And we were not uh, uh, allowed to do that earlier. So that was that was a big deal. 
coach, I've, I've heard you mention a few times, you know, just being challenged to do things. And then uh, the rule change that, would you consider yourself a fighter? Um, I probably would. Yes. I'm yeah. a fighter. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll play within the system, but if I see something that needs to be changed, I'll, I'll try to see what I can do to get it changed, but within the system. I mean, I'm not one of these people who will go out and protest, I guess, but I would go, I would say what needs to be done. And, you know, one of the questions that I always try to ask myself in any situation, uh, when I'm talking with students or mm -hmm. in a problem is how can I make this better? And, um, and if, if, and sometimes I can't, but other times I try to, you know, figure out solutions to a problem and, and work on it. Now, Coach, when you look at your career and the, the young women that you have just developed into great players, I was looking at the list and I'm looking at Sierra Sims, Kaya Woods, Natalie Shear, just, and this is just a few, this is mm -hmm. just a few. What is your secret to developing such great talent? over the over a long sustainable time period well i you know i don't know if it's a secret or not i just but you know i had standards and and um you know and high expectations for the students and 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 told them that from the beginning and you know if they came to play i would do everything i could to give them all the resources i could to help them become better and um you know for a long time i couldn't get the top players because um I didn't know about, we didn't have a, a winning record, but um, uh, as time goes on, you know, we, we were able to develop some good players and, and good people. And I think, you know, the, the secret is just, um, you know, helping them get better and helping them, um, you know, one of the things I like to do is catch them doing things right and really mm -hmm. using them for that. And, and uh, instead of always harping on the things they're doing wrong, you know, and, and, and so instead of, and, and trying to be an even tempered, type person instead of getting mad, you know, and, and having a temper tantrum, that kind of thing. I, I don't really believe that is very effective, especially with girls or women. Um, but, you know, I don't think there's any big secret. It's just one of these things. I love working with the students to help them get better. And I want them to get better all the way around, not just as golfers, but as people. And and I got to know them and um, liked them and, and wanted to help them. And it just sort of grew that way. Well, over your coaching career at, at Wake Forest, and you've been in a lot of big matches, you've won ACC championships, Eastern Regionals. What about your experience, your legacy as a coach and your time at Wake stands out the most? What moment would you say, those one or two moments that just seem to stand out in your mind the most? Well, I think one of the things, the most recent one would be Jennifer Cupcho winning the national championship. Yeah. Um, you know, she lost it the year before on the 17th hole. And usually um, in a situation like that, you don't get another chance. You know, you don't, you're not, you don't get yourself in that position to uh, compete for a national championship the next year. I mean, it's, it's usually one of those things, one and done kind of thing. It's, it's like you lost your opportunity. And, um, but she had, I mean, she has so much grit and so much determination and when, at the news conference after she had lost, one of the reporters asked her, well, what do you, how long do you think it's gonna take for you to get over this, this loss? And she said, well, I'm qualifying for the US Open in three days. So I guess when I get to that first tee, it's over. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just liked that about her. She was just determined. And then when she came back the next year, um, the first day she broke the course record and, and just wow. there. And, you know, she had to come from behind. She lost some shots on the last day. But I, I think having the team there to encourage her and to keep her loose and to give her a hard time while she was playing. I mean, I think all of those things just, but, but for her to come back and win, I, I, that was just huge. It was just, it, it, I, I was so proud of her because you don't get a chance, usually a second chance like that. And she hung in there and did. And the other moment I guess was back in 1995, we won the ACC championship on the last day coming from 10 shots behind. And, um, you know, it was one of those deals where I had been really after the students to practice their wedges and we were working all the time in practices with wedges and distance control. And I think we had about three or four of the students knock their drives into, um, you know, into the woods and they had to chip out. They, every one of them got up and down. And so uh, that really made me happy to know that we, the things that we had worked on, they, it, it made them better and it helped us win. 
But to come to bounce back on the last day was a good deal. Well, Coach, what what do you do day to day that you would if, if there is a young coach that is listening, what advice would you give for your for like day to day to help have sustainable success? What are some what some what is some advice you would give? Well, I think you know the one thing that the students really uh, respond to is that you treat them as a person and not as an athlete, um, and that you always take an interest in them. And so I would always ask them, you know, how how are things going with your roommate? You know, how are things going? With your classes? Um, and then we, you know, if they want to talk about it, we could. But at least they knew I was asking. And if they had a particular interest in a in some subject and there was going to be a lecture or a movie about it, I would tell them about it. I'd try to keep up with some of that stuff. But I think treating each of the students as um, individuals and, and really caring about them as people um, is really important. And the thing that, that I think is good too is to make practices fun and uh, challenging and have them, you know, they, they work, but then they're, at the end, we always had some sort of games we played, you know, where they, they had a challenge match with each other. And they really loved that. And, you know, they got into it and it was fun. You know, you, you got to keep it fun and, but competitive and you want to, you want to practice like you play. So you got to you know, make it competitive, but it's, it was all good. I mean, I, but I think the main thing is just, you know, taking the time to get to know the students. It's not a transactional arrangement. It's a, you know, I, I hope it's a transformational arrangement. So you spent your entire coaching career at Wake Forest. What kept you at Wake? What what was that thing that made you to say, you know, I, I like it here. I want to stay here. What was it about Wake Forest? Well, again, it's what I, what Wake stands for. I mean, I really believe in in um, deep in my heart that Wake is it's just such a powerful institution, and I really love what it stands for and what it does for the students and the process that the students go through in the four years that they're there. That they have to write papers for every class. They got to give class presentations. They have to be uh, do team. Uh, uh, presentations. And when you do that for four years in every class, you're going to be pretty articulate and you're going to be <laughs> confident and yeah. you'll be able to do a lot of stuff. And, and that's what I love to watch that, that change from, you know, students coming in. And I mean, I, I used to have these students and I called them clams, you know, they, there was talk, you know, they just clam up and you, you, you try to get something out of them and they wouldn't talk. And then you see this process taking place over the four years. And you know, by the time they're senior, they walk into a room and they got a presence and everybody's come up and talking. To them. They're, you know, they're so at ease. And I think, you know, that has nothing to do with golf. It has to do with Wake Forest and the type of institution that it is and that they really value um, the student in every way. Now, Coach, you were part of the 2020 uh, Hall of Fame class. What was that like when you got the call that you were part of that, that you were going into the Wake Forest Hall of Fame? I was totally shocked. I mean, I, I didn't, I, I didn't know what to say. Uh, all I could say was, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but uh, no, I was, I, I had no idea that that would ever happen because um, I'm not a, an alum of Wake Forest. And I thought, well, you know, you have to be an alum to be in the Hall of Fame. And um, I just never thought that, that that would ever be a possibility for me. Um, but when John Curry called and, and um, Pete Brubaker was on the phone and they were telling me, they, were, they, they had set it up that they were going to ask me about something. And then they told me about this and I went, oh my gosh, I can't, <laughs> it surprised me so much. And, uh, but it was really, it's, it's exciting, but it's very humbling because there are so many good uh, people in this class, particularly, but, you know, so many good athletes that have gone to Wake Forest that deserve the honor too. And, um, I just feel very humble that, that uh, I'm a part of that. Well, this year, well, Wake is celebrating 50 years of women's athletics. How does it feel to be a part of establishing that rich tradition of women's athletics at Wake Forest? Because you're a big part of that. Well, it's, it's, it's been exciting to see the change and development because, you know, at the beginning, I really had to fight for the women's programs a lot. And, um, um, you know, it, 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 it was, it, you know, it was, it, that was a time, you know, when Title IX was just taking off and, and, and becoming effective. And, um, and then to see what has happened just, you know, in the last 15 years with all the facilities and everything is being 
you know, built and uh, with the, the, the idea that both the men's and women's teams can use them equally. And, and the whole culture has changed. And to be, a, you know, kind of a small part of that, of that process has been really exciting. And, and to see where we have come. Um, you know, I remember when, when I first was coaching, if we went to the, when we went first to the NCAA, it's a full week of, uh, um, you know, of play. And so, you know, we had had seven uniforms and we only had four. And so I always had to go to the laundromat. You know, and, and and do their laundry, so we'd have enough uniforms to wear and clean. You know, uniforms to wear for the whole week. You know, and now we have these Nike contracts, and we have equipment contracts, and we have people who want to support our program. And you know, it's just so in, um, heartening to see that, and so exciting to see. You know, the and the students are 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 so appreciative of what they have now. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times um, you you get you come to, you have programs where the students feel pretty entitled. And um, I don't, I think there's something about Wake Forest that they don't feel entitled, they feel grateful. And, and that's, you know, when you're coaching somebody, it's always nice to coach a grateful young lady. Well, coach, you talked about facilities and uh, that being a part of a growing program and a developing program. What do you think about the impact of the Diane Daly Golf Learning Center. Learning Center. When, you, when you saw that, what what did that what does that mean to you? Oh, that's I mean, I, I just can't believe every time I go up there and see my name on that building that it's 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 actually true. And the donor who you know gave that building um, could have named it for herself and she didn't want to. She she wanted me to be a part of that. And I just am so grateful and you know, for, to her and to, um, you know, to Wake Forest for allowing that to happen. And um, that's, that building is such a neat building because it, it is, you can do so much in it. You know, you have a club repair room and you got this putt view system where you can hit any kind of putts and learn how to really putt. Um, you can hit uh, in the hitting bays when the weather is bad and, and they're heated. And we never missed a practice, you know, when we had, uh, when I was coaching, because we, we were able to it from inside out, even if it's snowing, we would practice. It. And so, you know, it's it to have that is just a phenomenal thing. And, and to have the whole facility, the Haddock House, you know, the Arnold Palmer Golf Complex, the whole thing. I mean, I, I tell people I feel like I'm a kid in a candy shop every time. <laughs> I, there's, there's not a shot you can't hit. I mean, it, you can practice anything. And uh, and I think it, it to be a good golfer, I think you have to be pretty creative and adaptable. And, and you can go out in the middle of that field and you can just invent shots. And it's, that's really exciting. Well, Coach, when you look at where the program is now, what Coach Llewellyn is doing there and the success that she's having, what do you see continuing? Or what do you see being a part of the program in the future? How do you see it evolving? I, I, uh, Coach Llewellyn is doing a superb job. Yeah. I mean, she's really taking the program and and really uh, taking it a step further than I. And, you know, she just has done such a, a good job with developing these young ladies as golfers. And, you know, Ryan Potter has also helped a lot as associate head coach. And, you know, they make a great team. And I mean, there is no reason in the world why we can't be a contender every year for a national championship. Um, you know, with her, uh, she's so knowledgeable. She and Ryan both are just incredibly knowledgeable about golf and about teaching. They have wonderful personalities and so engaging that you know a student would want to be coached by them, and 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 I think that's really exciting. Um, and you know I think the recruiting is always a big um, a, a big deal, and we have to do it. And and I think Kim is a wonderful recruiter. I mean, she you know why would you not want to come to play for her? I mean, she's she has so much energy and and uh, she's so positive. And her husband is so helpful with with the the team and you know it's it's it is truly a family uh situation with with kim and her family and now ryan and his family i mean they the, the students really feel like they're coming not to a program but to a family and i think that's exciting for the future of our program well coach that's that's exciting i gotta be honest sometimes i feel embarrassed that uh wake has such a wonderful golf program and i am so terrible i am <laughs> <What> terrible <else? laughs> Oh, it's, it is, it is, uh, uh, it's a fun sport, but it, it can be frustrating. You know, I, I, it definitely can be frustrating, but it's, it is so much fun. And, you know, one of the things that we used to do is have our fact, have 
the students bring their faculty members out, their, their favorite faculty teacher, and, and, uh, and we would have a clinic for them. And they would teach their teacher. And that was always fun. Yeah, I need that clinic. I need you guys to start that up again so I could be the first in line. Yeah, for that you got to come out. We'll, we'll get you out there. Well, Coach, one last uh, question I want to ask you is when you look back over your coaching legacy and your legacy as a player and your contribution to the game, what stands out to you the most? And what do you want people to remember most about you? Oh, that's a tough question. I. You know, I think the one thing that I always tried to do as a coach was to learn from the students. And, and you know, they made me a good coach. And I didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing. And, um, but, you know, I always could learn something from them. And it was just a matter of listening and, and uh, hearing what they had to say a lot. Sometimes it was not hard. It was hard to hear it. But, um, but I think, you know, the, the students really made me a better coach. And, um, and when I look back and, and I think about what has happened over the years and the friendships that I still have with some of these students, it's just great. And, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lifetime thing. You know, I used to tell them, I said, you don't, you're not coming here for four years, you're coming here for life, you got me. And, and so anytime, you know, they wanna, you know, call me up or do it or, or chat or ask any advice or job recommendations or whatever. And I do, and I, they, they continue to do that now and it's fun. And so that's what, I mean, that's exciting for me as a coach to look back and see all those wonderful young ladies that I've had and, um, and how you know, appreciative they were of being in a part of the program. And, and, and they weren't always necessarily the, the top athletes. They were, they were glad just to be there and, and to be a part of everything. And so that's, you know, I, I just hope that, that um, I hope I have made an impact. Well, Coach, thank you uh, again for being a part of the podcast. We ask, we ask each guest this question. Who would you suggest that we talk to next? Who you think would be a great guest? I think Ken would be. Coach oh, Will. wow. Okay. Yeah, she, okay. You, 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 she is so um, – you can't keep up with her. She has so much energy. <laughs> it's just, she's wonderful. And, uh, and she has lots of ideas. And she's had a lot of experience in different areas. Um, you know, she's coached at the Citadel, she coached East Carolina, then she coached at Virginia, and now she's at Wake, and she loves Wake Forest. And um, it is, we're just so lucky to have her. But I think she would be wonderful to, to uh, have on your, on your podcast, because I think uh, it, her energy is so contagious. It's just, it's fun. She'd be a great interview. Well, Deacon Nation, you've heard it. We, we've got to get Coach Luella on here and... Uh, and, and feel her energy. So coach, again, thank you so much for taking the time out uh, and being with us here on the podcast. Uh, remember, we got to support uh, Wake Athletics and Women's Golf Program, and we're celebrating 50 years of women athletics. Coach, any any advice, any parting words? No, just, uh, um, um, you know, it's been a great 50 years of women's athletics, and we're looking forward to 50 more good ones and, and make it even better. I can't wait. Well, Coach, you have a good one. And uh, we, I know we're going to catch you around campus and, and at some of the matches and things like that still, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm still teaching a little bit out there. I, I, uh, I try to – I have some – I teach private lessons out there when the teams are not there. And so I try to, um, you know, just do a little – I'm out there a little bit. but it, And then I try to stay involved with some of the team now because most of the stu students on the team now are all students that I recruited at one point. So, That's awesome. The next year, the next year I will be new new students that I don't know, but everyone now this year up to this year I know. So it's kind of fun to be out there, and I hope to have them over for dinner and you know stay involved. And Kim has been wonderful about including me in everything, so it's been great. Well, Coach, again, thank you so much for taking the time out and uh, just sharing your story. Well, thank you for having me, Kevin. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye bye.